Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. Thanks, Caroline. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Caroline, before I introduce today's guest, give me something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America. This week, I discovered that not only was David Crockett a well-known frontiersman, but he also served three terms in Congress representing Northwest Tennessee. Hey, you know, that's a that's a fun fact near and dear to my heart. And it's such a coincidence that you have a discovery about a celebrity because today is our annual Elvis Week episode. Fans are gathered in Memphis this week to mark the 45th anniversary of the passing of the King of Rock and Roll. And we have the privilege of hearing from someone today who had a literal front row seat to Elvis's life and career from 1972 until his death in 1977. Sam Thompson first met Elvis when his sister, Linda, began dating him. Welcome, Sam. It's so great to have you here with us. Remind me, where are you actually from? Uh, Memphis. I was born, born in, my father was born in Arkansas and uh, my mother was born in Dyer uh, in that area up there. And, um, you know, after World War II, my dad was in the service. He was in uh, an engineering combat battalion, landed on on D-Day in Omaha Beach and fought in World War II all the way through to the end of it. And after the war was over, um, he was, got a job in Memphis because he was from a little town in Arkansas, Monette, uh, Buffalo Township. There's a wide spot in the road, but uh, came to Memphis and my mother had worked at a munitions plant during the war. So they met, got married and uh, up popped me in 1948. (laughs) So I went to Kingsbury High School there in Memphis with Linda. That's where we graduated from. And then I went to, it was Memphis State back then. Sure. Uh, now, I always say they, they painted it and changed the name to the University of Memphis. <laughs> but um, I got my degree in 1970, uh, and uh, I went to work for the Coca-Cola company right out of college, and uh, they sent me to Boston. I was an investigator for their legal division in corp- corporate legal. And uh, so we were investigating outlets and other restaurants for copyright abuse and that type of thing. So it kind of got me started in the legal profession right away. Uh, and uh, I spent a couple of years with them, uh, mostly in the Northeast, Boston, New York, that area. And I was on the road and I met, and I was going actually back from New York to Atlanta in a car. And I was going to turn my car in because I didn't need it in New York. And I was going through uh, Bloomington, Illinois, and I had a little fender bender. Now I had hair to my shoulders, red, <laughs> white, and blue tennis shoes, and a Captain America t shirt on. And that cop just said, get in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, back in those days, if you had an accident, they would take your license in lieu of a bond if you were out of state. So that's what they did, you know. And so I had to stay there for a couple of weeks uh, and get my car fixed. And I was staying at a Ramada Inn and the desk clerk and I became friends. Make a long story short, uh, he was dating my wife's, my wife's roommate. So he set us up on a blind date. And two weeks after we met, I asked her to marry me, and we've been married 50 years. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. What a story. So now I brought, what, her to what, brought her to Memphis. <laughs> what what uh, neighborhood in Memphis uh, did you grow up? We grew up uh, in uh, nor- northeast Memphis. I grew up actually on Queensbury Circle, sure. right across the street from Kingsbury High School, right off okay. of Bayless, Macon area. Yeah. Uh, Summer Avenue was my my strip, you know, that, that area right there. That's where we grew up. And so did you have any kind of encounters with Elvis, you know, while you were running around at that time? No, you know, I didn't. And of course I was aware of him being there. I mean, everybody was, you know, I mean, he was so well known and, uh, uh, you know, there would every now and then there'd be a little little clip in the paper or something about an Elvis sighting or something like that. But I, I, you know, I didn't really, uh, I was 
13 years younger than him. And so my music was uh, really, it was Motown. It was Stax and Motown. I love the Drifters, the, the Temptations, little Anthony and the Imperials, you know. Uh, and then, of course, you know, a lot of the pop music that was that was back in those days. Funny stories after I went to work for Elvis. I went, I met him actually first Christmas. I met him 72. He gave me an album, a Christmas album, and he signed it and said, Merry Christmas. And I thought that's really cool, you know. And gave me something else too, I forgot, but I took the album home and played it. And it was a white an album that was white and it had Christmas uh, ornaments on it. So I, it was something I remembered. So the next Christmas, he gave me the same album. And I kind of thought, that was odd. And I thought, you know, we were just friends back then. And I said, hey, you, you know, this is great. Thanks. But, you know, our, you already gave me one of these. He said, I know. I'm going to make damn sure you got some of my music. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I tell people that I wasn't, um, a lot of these fans, that they love his music so much, and I don't want to disabuse them of that, but I wasn't necessarily a, a fan of his music. But after got to know him, and of course, he and Linda were in a romantic relationship, and my parents loved him. And, you know, he, he, you know, he bought my parents a house. He bought me a house, Linda a house. I mean, he was so good to my family. Uh, my grandmother, uh, uh, yeah, lived in Lauderdale courts. And when he was a little boy, he would come to her back door and get buttermilk and cornbread. Wow. And, and, and he remembered that. And when That's my crazy. grandmother, yeah, when my grandmother died, um, he paid for the funeral and he, he actually, uh, picked out a plot in Forest Hill Cemetery as close. He told me as close to his mother as he could and paid for it. And then, uh, he was in the hospital at that time. And then the 75. And, um, and so he had a voice, the group voice, Flyda and Tim Beatty and, uh, oh, what, Cheryl Nielsen and Jay and, uh, Sumner, um, Donnie JD. Sumner. Oh, Donnie. Yeah. Sumner. Donnie. Yeah. yeah. And they flew and, down from Nashville and they sang a cappella at the gravesite. Wasn't it dry in the house, you know? Yeah. But, um, so, you know, that's, that's sort of how, how all that started. So I became a, a fan of the man personally first. Uh, and then, of course, after I started going on some of these concerts, you know, I was kind of busy. People used to say, well, you know, you're not smiling. I said, well, I was working. You know, I, I wasn't listening to music necessarily. I was watching the crowd looking for threat assessment. But um, after I relaxed a little bit and heard of these songs over and over and over, I really began to appreciate him as, as a musician. Uh, and then in the recording studios, when I would go with him to Stax, uh, in different places, I would watch him. And he literally was his own producer, He, and, which is, you know, I had a record company years later out in California with David Foster, 143 Records. So I did all these producer, I was the lawyer for the record company, and we did all these producer agreements, and I worked with top producers. And I would watch them in the in the studio and how they would work with artists in terms of, you know, the sound and the balance and things like that. And, and listen to, did they, did they sing in, in, in tempo? Did they sing in pitch? You know, not just in tune. And I began to realize that although Felton Jarvis was Elvis's producer, he really didn't do a lot of producing in the studio. Elvis produced himself. So, you know, all of this was cumulative. And uh, so I began to really admire the fellow for his, his musical acumen. So what did you think, I'm assuming, that the first time you really became hyper aware of Elvis was when your sister said, Hey, guess who I've gone out on Pretty a date much. with? <laughs> How did that go down? Well, you know, I was, I was a deputy sheriff at that time and uh, Bill Morris had been the sheriff and he had become the County mayor. And I, I no, I'm sorry, Bill, Bill had left, I think to run for office. And so um, uh, Skip Nixon, Roy Nixon was the sheriff. And I was, so I was a cop and I guess I was, uh, uh, well, I'll just tell you how it was. That was my little sister. And Elvis was older than her. He'd been married, he'd been divorced, and he had a child. And he was a rock and roll star. And I was convinced that he was going to break her heart, you know. So they, they met in, I think, July of 72. And so right away, she wanted us to come over and meet him. And I really held back because I thought, well, I don't encourage this because I don't think it's really going to go anywhere. I don't want her to be crushed, you know. Uh, next thing I know, my mother and father had gone to Graceland and met him. So, and my mother, now, now this is, this is the South in 1972, the, the buckle of the Bible belt. And, and my sister has moved into Graceland without the benefit of matrimony. Wow. 
So, and so when, when I, when my mother told me that, that, you know, that she really thought they were in love and all like that, and, and, and literally that she had accepted this relationship, I said, well, what do I have to say about it? Because <laughs> he can convince my mother, <laughs> you know, he was a pretty good salesman. So uh, we went over there and we met uh, and uh, I was still in, I was actually in a uniform. It was in November and, uh, and uh, went over there to Graceland and uh, was sitting down in the basement. And of course it, it didn't look like it looks now. It was more just a basement because Linda decorated all that with the yellow and the tile and everything. So we're sitting there and I had my back to the door and um, it was about one o'clock in the morning, Scott. And all of a sudden I just felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up and I turned around and there's Elvis standing in the doorway with a karate gi on, sunglasses, a little Greek fisherman cap and a Tipperillo cigar. And I thought that's the coolest thing I ever saw. I mean, it's one, <laughs> o'clock, it's one o'clock in the morning. There's no windows and he's in there with sunglasses on. <laughs> so, and you know, he walks all the way across the room sticks his hand out and says, hi, I'm Elvis Presley. You know, like, I don't know that I'm in his house to meet him, but he was just that uh, demeaning, you know, he was just uh, self-deprecating. So he was very polite. So I don't know, we sort of just hit it off. You know, Linda has a very uh, fond uh, way of saying this, and I don't like to tell other people's stories, but, uh, but she says, you know, she knew Elvis before she knew Elvis. I felt that way. You know, George Klein, Jerry Schilling, Red West, Elvis, and me all came from that North Memphis area. We all were, were poor. All of us had lived in public housing at some point. So, you know, I, 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 I knew all the hymns that he sang. I knew the, the foods he ate. I, you know, I knew the streets that he grew up on. So we had a lot in common. So we sort of hit it off right away. And uh, it just it went from there. It's funny you say that there are cultural things that that are associated with Elvis that I know my own parents who are from this area, you know, from this area around the same time also did, you yeah. know, peanut butter and banana and, yeah. you know, things like that was just part of the culture. Staff of life. <laughs> so was Elvis fascinated with the fact that you were a policeman? Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the first things he did because he was had just come from practicing karate, I understand it, but uh, he... Uh, he wanted to show me a few things that he had learned. He said, you know, and he wanted to see the weapon I was carrying. And at that time I had a 357 Magnum, a model 66, which was a stainless steel Smith and Wesson. And he, and so I pulled it out and I made sure I unloaded it, you know, and, and that was easy with a wheel gun, you know, you just show the cylinder. But when I unloaded it, you know, and he looked at it and admired it. And, and then he, he said, well, just, uh, you know, uh, point the gun at me, which I was reluctant to do, you know, but I knew it was empty. And then he showed me a disarming technique where he snapped his arms together and that gun flew across the room. And so, yeah, he, but, but he loved being, yeah, he told me, he said, if he had not done what he was, what had God given him the talent to do that he would have loved to have been a police officer. He was, he was a huge supporter of law enforcement. And, you know, the whole time I knew him, he would collect badges from all these officers. It was so funny. I, I, a couple of times, I remember one in particular, and we're, I think it was in uh, Ohio somewhere. And we're standing there, and there's an officer right beside me and Elvis. At, no, I'm sorry, Louisiana. It was in Louisiana because they have that shaped badge like their state. <laughs> and Elvis kept, he was about to go on stage now. And he kept looking down. And he said, man, that's a good looking badge. And this guy was a major or something. He said, thank you, you know. And he kept looking at it. He'd touch it. He'd say, I really do like that. And so finally, at some point, I mean, this cop, he just takes a badge off and says, well, here, you can have this one. And so Elvis, you know, he's just like, you, you could, if he'd give him a Cadillac, he couldn't be any happier. <laughs> so he he takes the badge, he turns to me and says, here, he, hold this for me. And if I put it in my pocket, he goes out and does the show. And after the show, of course, they say, hey, you still got that badge? <laughs> <laughs> so he put it in his case, you know. But that's just uh, that's just who he was. He, 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 uh, he loved police officers and and, uh, and, and he was very supportive of law enforcement. So, um, how did you make the leap from, uh, him dating your sister and meeting him to actually working for him and, and going on the road? You know, uh, osmosis, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, uh, it's funny because, you know, when you went to work for Elvis, you didn't fill out an application or anything. I mean, it, he, 
he really didn't want to anybody around him that he didn't know. And he liked to get to know you first and see if you fit in with the group and was it a comfortable thing. And, um, and I was around almost immediately. You know, I mean, I knew Billy and Joe Smith there and I knew all the guys. And, uh, and you know, when uh, there were guys like Lamar who lived in Nashville and Joe Esposito who lived in California, at that time, Jerry Schilling in California and others, but they would come in for the tours. But between the tours and all, it was Elvis and Billy and Joe at the house and Charlie Hodge. And, uh, and in 73, he bought a house for me right next to Graceland. So I was over there constantly after that. And, and so I, you know, he could see me sort of integrate myself with the other people. And, uh, and then when they would have shows and, and get ready for concert tours, even if I didn't go on that tour, I'd be around. And so I'd meet everybody that was there. And I knew his, and then later on when he got his uh, plane, the Lisa Marie, of course, I got to meet Elwood David, his pilot and Ron Strauss and all those guys, Jim Manny. So, you know, it was just by, uh, I guess, acclimation of experiences like that. And then I started going on a couple of the tours and uh, Red and Sonny were there then. And Dick Grobe was a police officer in Palm Springs. And he, like me, he started taking some time off from that work and then going with Elvis on tour. So I did the same thing. And uh, so, you know, I was, I've been on quite a few of the tours with them and, and, and I, you know, I, I was just, I was just uh, was trying to integrate a few things that I knew about, about crowd control, you know, like uh, that we would do on, on tours and Red, Red and, and Sonny was a really close friend of mine. I liked Red a lot, but so, but Sonny and I got very to be very close. And then of course, when Dick came on board, then Dick and I became full time. Then Dick and I got to be great friends too. So yeah, as you can see, it just sort of built up as a matter of experiences. And of course, I, I tell everybody, it certainly did not hurt that I was Linda's brother. You know, <laughs> I, I had this imprimatur of of. Uh, of officialdom right there. You know, he, of course he loved Linda. He loved my mother and father. And, uh, I was just an extension of all of that. So I was the recipient of a lot of goodwill and I'm the first one to admit that he, Elvis had a, a saying that, that I like to use a lot. He said, if you ever see a turtle on a 10 foot pole, he didn't get up there by himself. <laughs> and I, you know, I took that to heart. He, he said that to me one time and I have used it a thousand times in my life, which is really true. You know, none of us, I don't think, ever get to where where we want to be in our lives without help from somebody. Uh, and I certainly had a lot of help, you know, uh, getting getting into my relationship with Elvis. Did you, while you were going through all this, did you realize how special everything going on around you was at the time? Yeah, I did. I did. I, I, I knew it was momentous. You know, it's uh, it's hard not to. And I, I think I think the first time I really realized that was probably one of the first concerts I went on. Uh, when I saw, you know, 20,000 people, you know, and, and the way he could just manipulate people, make them stand up and sit down, that type of thing. And I remember particularly in 75 at the Silver Dome in uh, uh, Pontiac, Michigan, I went, I went there. And just, you know, it's an outdoor venue type of thing. And it was just 60,000 people. And I was just blown away. And, but, you know, gradually I began to realize just how, how important really this guy really was, you know, how huge he was and also how big this job was to protect somebody like that, you know, to move them around. And I would sit with, with back then with, uh, you know, with uh, Red and Sonny and Dick and we, and watch these guys plan out the security and how they would leapfrog from city to city. And somebody would go with the Colonel to set up advanced tours and somebody would stay with Elvis and, there was a lot to it. It wasn't just knuckle dragging and throwing people off the stage. You know, there was, it was a, a lot more cerebral than people think it was. It was a lot of logistics, just planning. So I was impressed by all of that too. Uh, and, you know, and, and he, he talked to me several times about coming to work for him. Uh, and I'd say, I think it probably started around 74. And, but, you know, I, I had a wife and two children and a job and I was drawing a paycheck and when he wanted me to go on tour, the sheriff would give me time off without pay or with pay if I had vacation. So I was, I was living that Walter Mitty world, Scott. I had, I had the best of both. I, I could be at home and have a family. And then when I want to go play with Elvis, I could and come back, but I didn't have to do it full time. So I was, uh, I wouldn't say reluctant, but I wasn't that eager. I, I never asked Elvis for a job, you know? Um, but then, uh, 
in uh, early summer, I think it was May or June of 76, uh, he had fired uh, Red, Red and Sonny and Dave Hebler. And uh, he called me and he pretty much said, look, you know, I, we've talked about this before, but it's really not an option. Now I need you because I don't have enough security. And I, you know, I remember saying, you know, well, is this, do you want me to come for a, a month or so? I can see if I can get some time off. He said, no, I want you to leave the sheriff's department. I want you to come full time. And, you know, I'm sitting in a house he bought for me with a car in the driveway he bought for me. And my, with my parents living there and, and Linda, I mean, it was, what could I say? So it, it wasn't like I was reluctant, but I owed the man. I owed him a lot. And, uh, and he did need security. So I, I left the sheriff's department and uh, went full time with him. Uh, and of course, I was the first one to go back after Elvis died. Two weeks after he died, I was back in a uniform. So did, did you did you feel like when you went to work for him, were were you getting your orders, so to speak, from the colonel or Vernon or Elvis or how did that work? Yeah, well, Elvis. Yeah, I, it was always for me, always Elvis, and and it often came uh, through Joe Esposito. From Elvis, uh, that and that that's kind of an interesting uh, concept because over the years I've been um, described as chief of security, and Sonny was described as chief, and Dick Grove as chief. You know, well, we didn't really have a chief of security. Uh, we were bodyguards, and we we pretty much took our lead from Joe Esposito. He was the road manager, so you know, Joe Joe would set things up and set things in motion, and then of course we were professional enough; we knew our job. Once we had the tour sheets. And we, we knew what cities we were going to be in. And we had scattered them out in terms of tour heights and ingress and egress and that type of thing and other threat assessments from the local police departments. We knew what, what to do. But, uh, but Joe Esposito, he was the leader of, of the band for us, you know. And, of course, all that was coming from Elvis to Joe to us. And, and there were sometimes conflicts with uh, the colonel because um, after Sonny left, uh, he, he would travel with the Colonel a great deal and, and sometimes Lamar fight. Uh, and then it really fell to me uh, and Dick because there's just the two of us as principal bodyguards. So we would take turns going with the Colonel uh, to the next city, you know, get up at five o'clock in the morning, have curtain breakfast with the Colonel at six and take off with him on that jet star and set the whole the town up security and all of that. And then meet the plane at night with the other bodyguard. And then the next day flip. You know, so we we did that most most every tour, which is why on some of these pictures, sometimes you'll see me with Elvis and sometimes Dick with Elvis in different cities because the other one was with the colonel. And uh, and the colonel, you know, he sort of had I had a lot of respect for the man. I wasn't I, I didn't feel real close to him like Greg McDonald or, um, or Charles Stone because they actually worked for the colonel. But I worked for Elvis, and Elvis made sure that I understood that I worked for him and not the colonel. So there was that natural tension, that, that arm's length relationship that I had. But the colonel was good to me. I, I remember in 1984, after I got out of law school, uh, the colonel had a lawyer in Memphis. And that lawyer called me and said, you know, I talked to the colonel, and, I, and he said, You're, uh, you know, you have to apply for a bar license. Uh, with the uh, professional responsibility board here in Tennessee, and you need a letter of recommendation. And he said, would, would you mind if I asked the colonel if he would write one? And I said, that'd be great. And I had this letter written from the colonel on that wagon wheel stationery. Yeah. Talking about of all the people he met in 50 years of show business, how I was the most dependable and reliable. And I couldn't believe this, this letter this guy wrote me. And every year, up until the, the, the year he died, uh, the colonel would send me a Christmas card with a picture of him and said, Merry Christmas from the colonel. You know, so, so see, he had that side, too. Yeah. But, but he was all business. And, of course, he, uh, the, the, only, the only conflicts I ever had with the colonel was when he wanted me to t tell him a lot of things about Elvis that I didn't want to tell him. You know, he, he sort of, as my mother would say, he would pump me for information, you know. <laughs> yeah, I believe that. Uh, yeah, and uh, and I wouldn't give it to him because my loyalty was to Elvis, and he he would get angry with it. The colonel would get angry sometimes. And I'm sure you've been asked this a thousand times, but and and I know you've seen the movie. Um, how does the movie compare to what you experienced in real life? Well, it was a movie, you know, and um, and as as all movies are, you know, it it, it has to be. 
it has to be cut down to a certain amount of time frame. I used this analogy the other day. I was talking to somebody. When I had a record company, we would have some wonderful tracks that would be laid down. We had Josh Groban and Michael Buble, and, and we produced Celine Dion and, and many others. And, and I was the lawyer doing all those deals, but I would be in the studio with them because you know what? They all wanted to meet the guy that worked for Elvis. It was, it was kind of crazy. But uh, we end up with a four minute track, which, but you couldn't get anything played on the radio. You know, had to go under three minutes. So I know what that's like artistically to have to cut down these things. And, um, and that's what happened in this movie. Uh, there, there are people that were not portrayed. And by the way, I'm not talking about myself. I have, uh, you know, I, I was there for a cup of coffee. So I never expected to be in, in the movie. I'm not that important to Elvis. But there were people that were without me naming them and his, a lot of his family and his very close friends, his girlfriends, that type of thing, you know. But you can't put all of that into a two and a half hour movie. Uh, so I'm, I appreciate people's perspective and their opinion on that, uh, but I don't have, a, I don't have a, a dog in that hunt. You know, what'd, you think about, what'd you think about uh, the shots of Graceland in the past? You know what? I actually, when I watched that movie, I only saw it once in the afternoon, but I actually thought they shot it in Graceland at some point. But I found out later that I guess they built the sets for all of that. But they did an extremely good job. Yeah, I really, because, you know, of course I wasn't there, but I have in my head what, having been at the current Graceland, what yeah. it must have looked like. And so they really captured that for me. I think they did. And then the other thing that I think that blew my mind a little bit, they never referenced um, Joe Gershio. Um, right. but, the, but I think I saw him young in the background, you know, and there were several people like that, that I thought, I think that's supposed to be, you know, fill in the blank yeah. back yeah. then. Yeah. And yeah. You know, and, and Jerry, Sch the fellow that played Jerry Schilling, uh, probably was like a composite character for all of us, you know, that there was around Elvis, but of course, Jerry was, uh, uh, was very close to Elvis and, uh, you know, but I don't know. I, I, the only thing I will say is that, is that I did get a sense that, uh, the portrayal of Elvis was a little bit sad and morose and troubled. And that's really not the Elvis that I knew. Elvis mm -hmm. loved being Elvis and he was a beauty. He was happy. He was looking forward to tomorrow, the next tour. Uh, so I, I, I don't think the movie quite depicted the, the same guy that I knew, but Hey, that's just my subjective personal opinion, you know? Uh, and here again, I think Baz Luhrmann was trying to capture the whole, the whole package and make, make a presentation. I do think the music was fantastic. I think the young man that played Elvis did an extremely good job. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I think one of the purposes, obviously, of the movie is to, is to introduce the man, his music, to a younger generation, and particularly to a generation that could not understand what an iconic explosion that he was on the musical scene in 1954. You know, and, and that's a part of musical history that I enjoy watching because Elvis changed music, and it showed that. So I thought that was uh, that was an important part of the movie. Yeah, I like that a lot too, and I like whether it whether it captured reality or not. I loved the Vegas concert yeah. energy, you know, just from seeing the pictures, and you know, to yeah. me, it was really fun to actually see the see that part of it. Vegas, the Vegas shows. I was at the Vegas shows, uh, 74, 75, 76, 77. And, <laughs> and, that, because, and, and most of those years, well, 76, 77, I was working there, but 74 and five, I was just a guest, you know, and they were amazing, you know, but, uh, now but how you, do you I, handle, how do you handle security when you're trying to keep him safe and he's walking around in the audience? It's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that easy, trust me. But you know, but you know, Gershio had this. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the story about Joe Gershio after he started working with Elvis as his musical director. Somebody asked him, "said Well, how do you like working for Elvis?" He said, "Man, it's like." And Joe was kind of an old hippie, you know. I, I loved him, and he was like, "Man, it, it's sort of like." Uh, following a bouncing marble down the steps. <laughs> so the next night when he got to his dressing room and he opened the dressing room, there was like a thousand marbles that just came <laughs> rolling out of his dressing room because Elvis was playing a prank on him. But that's really what it was with Elvis. Uh, and if you talk to any of the musicians, uh, Ronnie Tut used to, the late Ronnie Tut, who I loved so much, uh, he, uh, he used to tell me that, uh, that, that when he was a drummer, that he was like drumming for a stripper. 
he would watch. That's exactly what he said. He said he would watch <laughs> Elvis and watch his moves and just try to follow him. And that's what we did, Scott. I mean, he, you know, we, you know, it, that was it Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until you get hit in the nose or something. And that's what happened to us. We had plans for every concert, but they almost never went according to plan. We had our unlimited substitution rule, depending on what Elvis did. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, but it was a huge challenge. Now, um, after Elvis passed away, uh, were you part of the security detail that helped keep all the bedlam going on at, yeah. at bay as much as possible? Yeah, the day he died, I was going to Grayson to pick up Lisa Marie. She had been in Memphis. Uh, she had overextended her visitation. And Elvis wanted me to carry her back to uh, um, Priscilla. And I had done that once before. So, you know, back in those days, you know, I, I was still carrying sheriff's credentials as a sergeant. So I would just show my credentials to the pilot and tell him I was carrying a gun. And if the pilot said that was OK, it was OK. It was it was a different world. And of course, once you let him know you got Elvis's daughter with you, it was, you know, first class all the way. So uh, I was getting ready to do that and uh, got to Graceland and I saw the ambulance there in the front. And I thought it was Vernon because I knew he had a bad heart and he'd had some problems before. So uh, when I went inside expecting to see that, there sat Vernon in the chair. And I got there just as the ambulance had come back from the hospital with Dr. Nick. And so I was there when Nick told Vernon that Elvis had passed away. And of course he just fell apart. And, uh, and then I, and I, you know, I was just stunned to trying to absorb all of this. And then I remembered there's a nine year old girl here that I'm in, that I'm in charge of right now. So I start looking for her in the house and I go back uh, around the stairwell and uh, near uh, uh, grandma's room, uh, which I think it was a lot of different people's room at one time, but this, the room near the staircase where Dodger was living. Mm -hmm. and I could hear Lisa Marie on the phone and she was saying, no, Linda, he's dead. They told me he died. And I went, oh, Lord. So I went in there and she's on the phone and she had called my sister in California. She still remembered her phone number and had called her. And, and so I just took the phone from her and I could hear Linda saying, oh, no, I'm sure he's just sick. And I said, Linda. And, and of course, that the conversation changed abruptly then, you know, but that's uh, so. Yeah. And so I so when I found that out that I'm and, and then I found out that Dick uh, had had found out what was going on. And he was at the hospital. So he and I started calling each other. And he stayed at the hospital and secured that scene. And I stayed at Graceland. I called the sheriff, the chief of police, the mayor. You know, they had all the police officers. They had Red Cross. They had the National Guard out there. And it was pandelirium. I, I didn't sleep for about three days. So. Yeah, I've heard stories and, you know, I've read, of course, and, and heard people on panel discussions talking about just how insane it was that all the flowers and that whole side of the state you know, were ordered and delivered to Graceland. And of course the, the, you know, national Enquirer were trying to sneak in photos and thousands and thousands of people everywhere. Um, yeah. you know, how, how in the world did you even begin to manage all that? Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think a lot of it was just responding from one crisis to the next. I don't think at that point you had much of a plan. Uh, of course, Vernon and, and, uh, Priscilla came in and then she, she and Vernon and Joe Esposito were a big part of planning of the funeral for Elvis. Um, and they knew pretty much what they wanted in terms of, you know, what kind of a service with, uh, what minister Rex, was it Rex, Rex Humboldt was his name? Rex, uh, Humbard. Humbard. Yeah. And they, you know, they, they knew all of that. So that wasn't, my, I had no role in that, no responsibility because I certainly didn't, didn't have that kind of a, a discretion, but, but I, I, but I did know what needed to be done to, to pretty much secure the premises and I needed bodies. So we had a, a large contingent from the sheriff's department and the police department there. Uh, and, and it was mostly crowd control for me. Uh, uh, and you know, there were people that would climb over the fence and that type of thing. And the big thing also was because of the heat that summer in August, people were just passing out like flies. So that's when we got the Red Cross out there and they sent tents up and resuscitated people. Uh, and then I guess the, the bigger issue became from a security standpoint, getting to and back from the mausoleum. And we, we set all that up. And uh, so I don't know, it, it was a group effort, that's for sure. You know, everybody sort of pitched in and, uh, and you know, I stayed with the, the body the night before, before the funeral. 
they, uh, at that time, I don't know if you remember, but they, there was a rumor, the police department called me and said that they had picked up information that they, someone was going to try to steal the body and hold it for ransom. And, you know, I kind of laughed that off at first. I thought, well, that's kind of silly, you know, but then they said, no, it's really true. And, uh, so, um, they, uh, uh, and actually they, I think they arrested three or four guys. And late, many years later, I was a warden at the, at the uh, correction center in Memphis. And, uh, one of the guys that, that was there, uh, that was accused of that was, was in prison for something else. And I wow. actually yeah, I got, got to say, you know, talk to him a little bit about this, but they actually had planned to do this. And, uh, so knowing that, you know, I had a security all around Graceland and the, and after the family visitation that night, because Priscilla and Lisa and her family were staying in Graceland and Priscilla asked me, she said, we're exhausted. Would you, you know, kindly ask everybody to leave so we can go to bed. So I had to be the heavy. I had to go around and get everybody out the door. And then Dick and I decided we would split the shifts up. And so I would stay the night. So I, as I put it, it was me and a pot of coffee and an 870 Remington pump shotgun sitting next to Elvis's open casket. And, wow. and I was there all night long and I had a police radio and a sheriff's radio uh, and they would make routine checks in and out of the house. And I would too. And I sat right next to the casket till six o'clock in the morning. And uh, so I had plenty of chance to say my own goodbyes, you know, and to assure myself that this was really uh, Elvis Presley in there, not a wax dummy or anything like that. And, um, and then, and then I went home and took a shower and put a suit on and came back. And th then we had the, the funeral. What do you remember about the funeral? Um, I, you know what? I remember mostly how fragile Vernon was. Uh, I wasn't a pallbearer, but, uh, but I, my, my job was to make sure Vernon was okay. And, uh, his girlfriend at the time, Sandy, uh, she was really good with him. And she, uh, she was on one side and I was on the other. And I actually had my, my hand on his belt, uh, behind him because he was just limp. Mm. And, uh, there's pictures actually of me helping him up and down the stairs at the mausoleum there. And, um, I guess that's the, of course it was a, a tremendously sad service, you know, too. Uh, gospel music that Elvis really loved. That's what was sung. And everybody thought, you know, Elvis would have loved this service because it was his music, you know, but, uh, and the message was good. And, and of course all those white limousines. And I also remember how striking it was, Scott, going down Elvis Presley Boulevard and on both sides of the road lined up. I mean, five, six people deep were all these people and all the police officers and law enforcement would take their hats off and, it was, uh, it, it was touching. It was really touching. It, it, it looked like a, a state funeral that you would have uh, for the head of a state or president. It, it was that type of a, of a crowd, you know. And it was uh, literally covered all over the world. So it was, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah. the world was watching Memphis and what was going on there. And, and at any given time during all of this, I would have a moment where I would just sit back and think this is surreal. It's, it's not really happening, you know. I mean, who dies at 42 years old? I mean, this right. is Elvis Presley. You know, you think he's going to be around forever. Uh, and so it was it was hard to grasp. Uh, and I'm a pretty much pretty much a realist. But uh, even for me, it was hard to grasp. When we get back from the break, I want to find out how you ended up going from Memphis to Hollywood to Vegas. The West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, Tennessee at exit 56 off I-40 offers an authentic Southern experience showcasing the history and culture of rural West Tennessee. Inside, visitors can learn about the history of cotton, explore the scenic and wild Hatchie River, and get to know the legendary musicians who called West Tennessee home. Also located on the grounds is Flag Grove School, the childhood school of Tina Turner, and the last home of blues pioneer Sleepy John Estes. To learn more about the center, visit WestTennesseeHeritage.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. What happens next? I mean, it seems like it would be anticlimactic, but you actually, you know, your part two 
was even bigger. So tell us a little bit about what happened next. Well, it wasn't bigger, but it was different. <laughs> well, you know, um, we, uh, I, I had always wanted to go back to the sheriff's department. And in fact, uh, Elvis and I had talked about it and I'd always wanted to go to law school. And we talked about that. And of course, our conversations would go to the, to the extent where he would say, well, I'll pay for you to go to law school and you'll be my lawyer. And we laughed about that. Of course, you know, that didn't happen. But uh, as an aside, very quickly, uh, he gave me a guitar. The last guitar he played in Indianapolis, Indiana, Market Square Arena was a, a, uh, um, a Martin guitar. He gave it to me. And I ended up selling that guitar to the National Enquirer and it paid for my tuition to law school. Oh so I tell people that Elvis... There's a lot more to that story. That was the that was the Reader's Digest version. But I tell people Elvis put me through law school. He just didn't know it. But um, and he would have been glad to. He would have he would have been glad mm -hmm. for that to have happened like that. Yes. But uh, you know, I, I I knew I was always going to go back. And so Vernon was bereft. He uh, you know he 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 had so much on him, and he was uh, I remember he was in his office a day or two after the funeral, and I was, and I went in there to see him. And he was like, what am I going to do? We're going to have to start laying people off. There's no money coming in, this and that. And I just told him, I said, well, I'm going to take a little, a little off of your shoulders because I can go back to the sheriff's department anytime. And so I gave him my two weeks notice. September 1st, I was back in the sheriff's uniform on the sheriff's payroll. Wow. And uh, so, uh, and so, and Dick stayed on. And, uh, you know, Vernon, he asked me, he said, would you, would you stay here and be, director of security and help me with this. And I, I just told him, I said, you've got somebody here that's good, good at that. And Dick wants that job. And I don't need that job. I have one. So, uh, so I went back to the sheriff's department, but I stayed really close, you know, to Vernon and to Dick. Uh, and then in October uh, of that year, Ver Vernon called me and he said, we're going to move Elvis's body and I want you to be in charge of the detail. And I said, well, I have to ask the sheriff. He said, no, I've already asked you. So, you know, so Roy Nixon was the sheriff at that. No, it was uh, Gene Barksdale was the sheriff then. And for anybody listening who doesn't know, uh, because of all the threats to kidnapping Elvis, yeah. and you know, they decided to move uh, him and move his grave to Graceland, where it is today. Right. And what, Ver what Vernon told me, too, is that the, not, only, not only were those threats, which were a continuation, I guess, or an extension of what was going on the night I had to spend with the body, but also, Vernon said that the fans from all over the world would come and chip away at the mausoleum for souvenirs. And so Forest Hill Cemeteries, you know, they were pretty upset. And uh, Vernon said, they're going to sue us. And I'll, I, I don't know any of that. I just know what he told me. And so they were able to get the city to give a permit to, to have a cemetery there at Graceland. So, uh, so Dick and I were in charge uh, Dick from the Grayson side and me from the law enforcement side of getting the bodies uh, um, disinterred. Glad we disinterred Gladys first, put her inside the mausoleum, and then at night we we moved both the bodies out out of the back of uh, that cemetery to the back of Graceland. Um, there used to be a back gate up there, and we took them in. And the uh, the the, far, the funeral people already had the the graves dug. And it was kind of macabre, you know. It was an October night, and it was kind of frosty, and there was almost nobody there. It wasn't a big ceremony or anything; just a handful of people. And uh, and they put the 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 the, uh, the casket into the graves and covered them up. And then, and you know, there are times in your life, Scott, where you just sort of, through circumstances, you just sort of feel that page turning, and you know it's time for you to move on to the next chapter of your life. That was that was what happened for me that night. So I guess, you know, even though a few months later I was with the sheriff's department trying to get my career started again, but I was still really tied umbilically to Graceland and to Vernon. And that night when that happened, I just I just felt like the page turned. And uh, and, and, you know, with, with very short period after that, I went down and applied for law school uh, and I continued to work at the sheriff's department. And after I got into law school, I went to law school at night, four years, four and a half years at night while I worked during the daytime with the sheriff's department and moved on with my life then. And so you ended up, uh, did you move out to California and in, in later? In, uh... Yeah, later. I, I, I went, I went to law school and, uh, and I graduated in 83, took the bar and all in 84, was still a sheriff's deputy. I became the sheriff's legal advisor, the first one they ever had. So I wrote all their pursuit policy, deadly force policy. And I, I was assistant county attorney. I represented the sheriff's department in federal court and state courts. 
did that for a while. I became kind of a little expert in prisoner litigation. And so um, I took over the County Correction Center, was the warden, except uh, superintendent for two and a half years. And I ran that facility and, and, and was able to get the facility out from under a federal consent decree. Bill Morris was the mayor who appointed me. Talk about Kismet and everything. This, these are the same people over and over, you know. So Bill, was he was our mayor then. And uh, so I did that. And in 1988, uh, Kenneth Turner was a juvenile court judge in Memphis. And I was very close to, with Curtis Person, who was a state senator. And so they asked me if I would be interested in being a judge in juvenile court. And so uh, I left Bill Morris and I went to work as a judge in juvenile court. And I was there for two years. And then in 1990, I ran for a general sessions bench uh, and I won it. And it was an eight year term, uh, it was a civil, civil bench. And uh, all that time tacked together. So I ended up with 25 years and, and a full retirement. And Linda was married to David Foster, who's a record producer. In fact, you can see in the background that red uh, record, that's Josh Groban's record. That, uh, okay. And uh, I was trying to see if that was an Elvis record. Well, no, it's Josh. And, 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 and I'm on, I'm on the liner notes of that. He thanks me, you know, for my, <laughs> my help and all, but uh, we, uh, but anyway, they were in California and they needed an attorney and they were, they were outsourcing an attorney because he had a joint venture with Warner music group and they were paying that, that lawyer more than I made as a judge. So, you know, David asked me, he said, would you be interested in doing that? And I said, well, sure. I, you know, I, I mean, I can read contracts. I know how to do this. So I retired and went to California and uh, I was the vice president of business and legal affairs for 143 Records, Warner Music Group. And I did that for about three years and we sold the company back to Warner Brothers. And when I did that, I retired again. I moved to Las Vegas and I ended up as the chairman of the Public Utilities Commission in Nevada for five years and I worked for three different governors there, legal work again, you know all these big rate cases and all of that, you know, for utilities. And then I finally retired from that in 2011. And, uh, and I live in Dallas, Texas, and I have both of my daughters here and both of my grandchildren and, uh, and a lot of heat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's nothing like California, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. And don't, don't you think Linda doesn't call me every now and then when it's really pretty weather and sort of rub it in a little bit, you know? <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah, no doubt. So, so, um, you know, you're, you've had about four different major chapters in yeah. your life. Um, how often does Elvis come up with people that maybe meet you for the first time and, and figure out your connection? Um, does that happen? It does. And more often than you might think, uh, they'll put two and two together, you know, uh, and there's some, I play golf with a bunch of guys here. There's about 12 of us and we, we play, you know, and, uh, and, and I play one of the guys I play with is one of my neighbors. And so, you know, I, I don't lead with that. I don't say, Hey, how you doing? You know, I work for Elvis, you know, I, <laughs> you know, we just, I sort of, I'm pretty low key on that kind of stuff and not very pretentious either, but, or try not to be certainly, but somebody will always say something, you know, to somebody else. And then that becomes a big topic of conversation. But, uh, it is remarkable uh, how much interest that there still is uh, in Elvis and his music and his legacy. So, and, I, and that's one of the things about that movie. I think maybe we'll set a few things straight about just so much more to him than the caricature that 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 uh, that he sort of became, you know, in popular culture. Well, I honestly, when I saw. Uh, the movie, one of the things I thought to myself was, I, I can't wait till Elvis week so I can ask Sam Thompson what <laughs> he really thinks about the movie. And so I got to do it on the podcast. So that's there, even there better. you go. Yeah. yeah. And now we, now we can just have a beer in Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. It's exactly <laughs> right. I'm looking forward to see you then. And I really thank you for taking some time out to talk uh, to me today. I, I'm happy to do it. You know, you're, you're living up there in my old, my old home stomping grounds and my, uh, my, my, I guess my three or four times great grandfather was uh, a blacksmith in uh, Haywood County. Okay. Before the before the Civil War, and his what was his, what was the last name? Was it Thompson? White. 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 Alan, Alan White. Yeah, they they moved from North Carolina in the in the early eighteen hundreds. Came across Tennessee, and then when it was open, it was Indian territory. So when Andy Jackson opened it up. They were because the they had a land grant from uh, uh, their their father who fought in the Revolutionary War. They couldn't pay him, so they gave him land. So they came to West Tennessee and settled. And uh, 
that's where my mother's family is all from, right up through there. So I'm actually a seventh generation Tennessean. Now, do you know by chance if they came from Bertie County, North Carolina? They came from Bertie County, North Carolina. Because I have whites in my family that came from Bertie County, North Carolina, and settled in Haywood County. It's cousin Scott. Listen, I think I think we're related. In Memphis, we'll compare notes and yeah. uh, we'll, and, and we'll look at that. There's a judge in Memphis, Lynn Cobb, that I used to work for and I work with when I was in general sessions. And Lynn's family, uh, he had a book and he had whites in his family. And the Cobbs and the whites all traveled together from Bertie County, North Carolina. And my family was with them. Uh, the he he uh, he and I have compared our oh, genealogy. So uh, yeah, we're probably wow. you know cousins four or five times yeah. removed. But yeah, it's a small world. Isn't that a small world? Yeah. And and I, I got on ancestry.com and tracked him back to Mordecai White, who mm-hmm. I don't know. In 1701, he came from Virginia into what is now North Carolina, but it was a Lord's proprietorship back then. It wasn't a state. And uh, and it, yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. I, at least if, if you like that kind of stuff, and I'm I'm a history nut, you know. But well, I like you'll have to you'll have to come up here to Discovery Park of America next time you've got a minute um, and check it out. You'll you'll uh, find it's uh, very uh, fun and interesting, especially for somebody who loves history. Uh, you know, I love history. Thanks to all of you listeners who have joined Sam and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Discovery Park of America.